Welcome back to Expert Instruction, the Teach by Design podcast where we dive deeper into the research surrounding student behavior by talking with the people implementing these practices, where they work, and with the students they support. I'm Megan Case. And I'm Nadia Sampson. There's a secret third co-host here with us today. (laughs) A secret friend in the room. Our friend and colleague Danielle Triplett joined us last month to talk about PBIS teams. And we loved having her and she loved being a part of the podcast so much. Well, we decided that we just invite her to take a more permanent seat at this expert instruction table. So now, do you want to share what you're going to be up to? I do. So I'm going to be taking the next few months off to spend more time on a research project that we have here in our department focused on check in, check out high school. So between working on the PBS apps training team and the grant, I've got lots to keep me busy, but I will miss podcasting. But I'm super excited that Danielle is joining this team. She has a ton of knowledge around schools and PBS implementation. It's it's going to be great. I really, I really agree. Excited. Me too. And don't worry, everybody. Nad promised she won't stay away forever. We hope that we'll have her drop in from time to time so that she can share her experience and wisdom in future episodes. But in the meantime, Danielle and I will carry on together every month. Welcome, Danielle. Hey, I'm super excited to join the podcast. I think it's such a fun way to engage with our educators, explore topics, and share knowledge. So I'm looking forward to being part of it for as long as you'll have me. Today's episode is the second installment of our Mythbuster series, where we take a common misunderstanding or a misperception related to the PBIS framework. We explore the research, we look at what real schools are doing, and we talk with our guests to prove or bust the myth. Which myth are we tackling today, Danielle? Today is a big one. The myth we're talking about is PBIS is just about rewards and tokens. And joining us in that conversation is our director here at PBIS Apps, Dr. Kent McIntosh. Kent is both our PBIS Apps director and the co-director of our department. He's also a co-director for the Center on PBIS, which is the National Technical Assistance Center supporting schools across all 50 states to sustain and scale up their PBIS implementation. During our conversation, we talked about how a reward or an acknowledgement system fits within the PBIS framework. We talked about examples of rewards that work and where sometimes we might get that a little bit wrong um, and how we can all center equity in the way that we acknowledge our students for the efforts that they make at school. Welcome, Ken. Thanks for joining us in our podcast. Thanks so much for inviting me. Happy yeah. to sit down and chat with you. Yeah, it's been a long time coming. I feel like we've been kind of just waiting for the right time to ask you to join. Um, since you work here and are in charge of all of us, it was like, well, when can he when can he be a part of this podcast? So thanks for agreeing to do it today. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, uh, long time uh, listener, first time joiner. First time caller. Yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, you get the privilege of being a part of our um, Mythbuster series this year, where we are taking PBIS misperceptions, things that people think are true about PBIS and exploring whether they are truly accurate in their depiction, or if there is maybe something that we could help them to clarify. And today we get to talk to you about this myth that PBIS is just about rewards, that it's all about the token economy. It's all about giving kids tickets so that they can buy pencils and erasers and books. Um, And so we wanted to we wanted to talk to you about it, both as the director of our department and also as um, a co-director from the the center for PBIS. Um, And maybe we can just start by asking, where do you think this idea comes from? Yeah, it's a really common one, I would say. Mm -hmm. And I and it comes from uh, a bunch of research that's happened over the years, but a lot of it in the 50s and 60s with this idea that um, 
if we give an external reward, like a thing, and and uh, it, that could be a ticket, that could be a pencil, that could be a sticker, or it could be just praise. Sure. That if um, if we give these sort of external or outside things, like not naturally happening things, uh, then we might damage a student's intrinsic motivation. Uh, yeah. And so that's a huge concern. We would be really, really worried if the things that we were recommending uh, were actually damaging children and students. And I think one of the things yeah. that's- I would have a lot of concerns about that also. Yeah. Oh, of course. Same. Same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, we all would. And yeah. so I think, you know, one of the things that I think about when uh, anytime we do like busting any of these myths is there is some kind of, you yeah. know, a little bit of evidence that comes behind it, or I heard a study or somebody right. shared this thing with me. Uh, and I've never been a big fan of saying, no, that's not true. And right. there's no such thing as intrinsic motivation or something like that, because we all have experiences uh, with that. And, um, and so taking it as you know, really a, a really important question and being able to dive into the research like I and, and many others have done uh, is really helpful in understanding when it could be helpful, when it could be harmful, mm -hmm. when rewards might actually increase intrinsic motivation. And so there is research out there supporting uh, the work that we do. Yeah. And I think too, for me, when I think about it, when I hear it from people, I don't know. It's the token economy is like the thing you can see, right? Mm -hmm. It's the it's the thing that's like everywhere and that the kids get excited about or it's like the fun fancy thing that um you know, if you earn enough of these things you get the prize, you know. And I think I think that the myth comes from just from placing an importance like uh, mm. like that is the only thing that we're doing is giving kids tickets for when we see them doing the right thing right. and not having a full appreciation of the framework that comes with this, that it is a part of PBIS certainly, mm -hmm. but that it's not the only thing, but it might be the only tangible thing mm -hmm. that people can see. The only practice that people see related to like what could be determined to be positive behavior, right? That, that's the thing that everyone sees. And so they think that's all it is. Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. When I think about it, so, you know, we just started school up and uh, my uh, younger kid is a middle schooler now and is in sixth grade. Um, and many people wouldn't see, but uh, his school set up an orientation day that is just for the sixth graders. And sure. then it just so happened, of course, that my eighth grader was teaching uh, uh, yeah. uh, little brother about that. So, yeah. uh, uh, so far I heard it went well. Um, but that's the instruction and in sort of what are the values that we have at this school? What are the things that are really important? What are the things that we should expect of each other, expect of our teachers? What kind of supports should be around? What does it mean to be a, a student at XYZ school. And when I think about that, that is something that probably was, unless you were there on that day, you didn't see that whole production. It was just sixth graders and then right. the eighth grade core leaders that were doing it. And so maybe you're there that day. Maybe you see a reteaching of a lesson because we know we want to be doing reteaching either when your data show that there are challenges or uh, coming back from breaks and so on. But that might not be as visible if you pop in on any given day that's not the first week of school to, to see that. So you see the tickets and you see the stuff and you know there's plenty of training systems out there you know, in terms of um, uh, preparation, university coursework and so on, kind of really asking people to be very thoughtful and cautious uh, about using rewards. And then people are kind of, primed and they see that and they go, hmm, what's going on here? And they either say, wow, that's a great idea. Or, oh, you know, uh, my professors and, and instructors said that that wasn't good or or I, I did it and it didn't work for me. Yeah. Yeah. You talked about um, about establishing what is expected or how things go in our school and what does it mean to be a jaguar or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. And so maybe we can spend just the tiniest bit of time talking about 
school-wide expectations, classroom-wide expectations, because I think it sets us up for talking more in depth about the purpose of the reward system that's in the school itself. So when we mm -hmm. think about school-wide expectations or even down to the classroom level, what what do we mean and why are they so integral to this framework that we all appreciate? Yeah, you bet. So I think of um, some people have different sort of number of core practices or so on of tier one or school-wide PBIS. And I think of we define or establish uh, what those expectations are. We teach them one of the five. The third one is acknowledge and then respond instructionally to the behavior that we don't want to see and then use data for decision making. And so when we think about it, if we think of that in a in a sort of sequence, and we shouldn't always think of it as a sequence, it's the third thing that shows up. It's not the first thing that's there. Mm, yeah. And so the big thing is when whenever we want to walk into a situation, it's really important to know what are people doing, what are people doing that they're supposed to be doing. What are the what is a way to be pro social and get along with people here? What are the routines that are helpful for us as a school community for success? Because we're all coming from different home lives and different contexts, and um, uh, you know it's really important. One of my favorite teachers of all time, uh, Anita Archer, uh, has a saying that uh, if we assume that students know what is expected of them, then we're committing a suicide. <laughs> and I think that part is really important, especially when maybe the life experiences, lived experiences or, or contexts or norms for behavior are really different for uh, the student, some of the student body than that looks like the teaching body mm -hmm. as well. And the, the more similar my, my um, experiences are with my students, the easier it is to be able to say, hey, um, you know, do it the right way. But what is right. the right way? And yeah. maybe the right way at school is actually not not a particularly safe or respectful way um, in in terms of the context from which our students come and um, pop out of those contexts for school a, a few hours a day. Mm -hmm. But the expectations themselves are are setting everybody up to to say this is where this is what we do when we're at school. And the really nice thing I think about the framework in general is that it's always important to co-create those expectations, right? That it's not just me as an educator or an administrator or a teacher to say, this is how you're going to be in my class. Mm -hmm. And then and then that's it. That there has to be some involvement from students, from other teachers, from families, possibly community members, like other specialists that are coming in. These are all people that are part of our school-wide community that have a say. And like you were saying, they all have experiences that they bring with them to school about what's how to be and how to not be. And mm -hmm. um and that it can't be just me saying, this is what you're going to do. So the yeah. expectation is our expectation as a school community or as a classroom community for what we're going to do so that we can all just be successful here. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. You know, one of the sort of traps that we get into in our dominant educational culture is this either or thinking. And yeah. so we have this either or thinking that says either teacher makes the rules and they tell them all to the students and the students follow them. Or, hey, let's all as a group come up with like any, like, let's start from a blank whiteboard and just start saying, how do we want to treat each other? Mm -hmm. um, and so those are like, in my mind, those are the two extremes of yes. ways that that work. But really, there's a middle way that uh, I think is way more effective. And we actually just released this week a lesson plan for classroom teachers in taking these school-wide expectations or the school-wide values and then co-creating what those look like, examples of what those are, examples and non-examples with students in the classroom. And so it gives the structure of the language that we're used to with PBIS, but then the, you're really co-creating with the students what it really looks like, what are the routines that are helpful, what are the ways that we value treating each other in the classroom that also align with the language that the other teachers around the school are using. Smart, that's so helpful. I'm going to go check it out. Um, so once we've got these behaviors, these expect expectations defined for what we're going to do, 
then now what, right? Like you, <laughs> you go on with school, right? And behaviors happen both expected and unexpected, right? And uh, and it gets to that spot where that you were talking about, which is the response to it. And one of those responses has to do with rewards. Yeah, the, the acknowledgement mm-hmm. that someone is, that you saw someone doing something that was great, that you, you appreciate. Bet. Yeah, what we want to do is we think about, we've defined them together, we've co-created them, we've taught and practiced them. Yes. And then part of really good teaching is providing that performance feedback. And this part of the podcast today, we're talking about uh, the positive part of it. How do we notice when people are doing things the right way? That's right. And I would love to say that human nature is to to be always be looking for all of the wonderful (laughs) things, Mm. but it is not uncommon for many people when we are busy that the things that catch our attention, the student behavior that catches our attention is what is unexpected for us, what is out of the norm, what are the things that we don't want to see. And it's very easy to forget that there's behavior all the time that's happening. And if we're only noticing and commenting on or correcting the things that we don't want to see, we're leading ourselves into, number one, a really kind of negative classroom climate. Uh, but number two, we're missing out on that opportunity of teaching, of being, being able to notice and being able to say, instead of this is what I want you to do and you're doing it, say, oh my gosh, Danielle is doing this really well. Let me let me um, share my thanks to you for uh, how you're um, being respectful of others in the way that you're moving around the classroom. Um, and so what a better, like, I can't think of a better way of involving students in instruction than noticing the behavior that we want to see and including that as part of the interactions we have. Of course. I was just thinking the other day, I was talking to a friend, I was just in Washington. No, I was in two larger cities. I was in Seattle and I was in Washington, D.C. with this same friend, ironically Mm -hmm. enough, or coincidentally enough. Um, And we were driving together in Seattle and we were at this wild intersection (laughs) And I was just like, I'm from a smaller place. I'm just going to do it with my very best. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was talking to her about it. And I said, you know, isn't driving just one giant trust exercise that we're all just assuming that we all know what we're supposed to do, <laughs> that we all passed a test and that we all are just going to like do the right thing here. And uh, and that hopefully like hopefully no one is going to run into me and I'm not going to run into them. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And so as you're talking, I was just thinking about that. Like we, we as drivers get caught for the wrong things. Right. And we get the, we get Mm -hmm. our, our ticket, our speeding ticket or whatever it is. Like there's like a, a moment where we do the wrong thing and we get caught for that, but no one is acknowledging all of the times that we've been working together collaboratively on this trust exercise called driving Mm. Seattle traffic. Right. And, um, but when you step back and you think about it, you're like, oh, we all know, and we all know what it is that we're supposed to do. Most of us, um, at this intersection, I know that to turn left, I need to make sure that no one's coming at me. I need to look to my right. I need to watch for the pedestrian and then I can move. But all of that had to be taught to me. And I needed to, I needed to learn all of that. And everybody has Ah. to go through that same process as a driver. Um, (laughs) but imagine like getting through it, I felt a relief, right? Getting through that intersection. I felt the relief of like, oh, I did it. But if some other driver had given me a thumbs up or like said, hey, Megan, you did awesome. I see you're not from here. You look like you're not, but you did it. You made it through that intersection. Like it's a small thing, but it would have been like, oh, it makes me feel part of this place, like these regular commuters that are going, they know that I'm doing a good job or they think that I'm doing a good job. Yeah. It's a silly, it's a silly like comparison, but it's one that came up for me recently as a grown up. And in school, especially like you were saying, you're um you have a kiddo who's a new middle schooler, right? Mm-hmm. So I assume that means that they change. They moved from ele- an elementary school building a-, a context to a new context. Yeah. And the the amount of reassurance that would happen in a classroom when they did the first assignment or had to dress down for PE or whatever, they get somewhere on time. The amount of like 
reassurance that that would give to a new kid or any kid in a given space would go a long way to getting them to try new things and be more confident as a learner in that space, I think. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And, and the things that I think about, and one, one thing that I loved about the eighth graders teaching the sixth graders is, you know, you're coming into middle school and you're kind of like, I mean, this is, this is sort of like your driving thing. I want <laughs> you know, like, should I trust my teachers? Should yeah. I do what they say? Should mm -hmm. I uh, tell them to blank off? Yeah. Or, you know, what's everybody else doing here? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. having other students doing that teaching and, and saying, yeah, this is, this is the right way of doing it. And, and uh, it's not just because it's the adults in the building who think they're the best in the world. It's that it actually works better for all of us. Yeah. And I think being having those opportunities for, um, you know, those eighth graders to say, hey, I noticed when you were doing that. Thanks very much. This is this is really, really helpful. Um, it, it's just a great way to uh, bring students into a school and have help them understand, like when you don't know what you're doing in a situation, uh, you know, what you're supposed to be doing, look around and see what your peers are doing. And mm -hmm. that is also why we spend so much time thinking about school wide or tier one mm -hmm. is we want when you look around and, and kind of cue into what's going on. We want most of the students to be acting in a pro-social way. What are the benefits for teachers then with a reward system? We've talked a little bit about how students benefit, right? And mm -hmm. What benefits for a teacher? You know, what I think about uh, almost all the time when I'm thinking about these rewards is it is really a support system for adults in the building. And it is a support that. system that helps us remember that we are supposed to be catching students doing things the right way and having this magic five to one um, um, positive to corrective ratios uh, in our interactions with students. And like I said before, it's very easy, especially when we're really busy, especially when we're really stressed, especially when we're thinking about running around and, and uh, getting our kids every single extracurricular activity. We're probably not being as proactive and thoughtful, and we end up being a little bit reactive. So any way that says, hey, adult, reminder, this is really important it's going to be like a, getting cued to say, remember to have a positive conversation about a success that a student or students of yours had. Mm -hmm. And that's the best use of that. It doesn't have to be a ticket. It doesn't have to be a, you know, I always say like, you know, do you think it's the like one in 100 chance of like winning a smelly eraser uh, on <laughs> Friday is like the thing that does it? Mm -hmm. No way. You know, it's that conversation with an adult, with an adult saying, hey, I saw what you did there and that was really cool. And yeah. so the best use of that is just it's a little mini celebration of what somebody did mm -hmm. afterwards. And I always think about it like um, uh, when I was teaching, I would just take a bunch of those school wide tickets. I'd shove them in my pocket. I wouldn't just shove a bunch. I would actually count out 15 of them. Uh -huh. And then like, I figured one of the signs of me being a good teacher was um, how many of them I had to pull out of my uh, lint basket in the dryer <laughs> because they were still there when I uh, uh, put my pants in the laundry. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. so that part is really key because I can go, hmm, I wonder how I wonder how my students are experiencing me right now. And that is a way, it's not the only way, but it is a way to sort of count how positive I'm being uh with them in the moment. Yeah. And it doesn't and have to be a ticket. It doesn't have to be, they don't even have to be connected to a prize or anything like that. It's just that reminder for me. Um, but then sometimes I think the other addition that I wanted to add in here was. Um, especially for students where I haven't been able to build a really positive mm. relationship with them yet, it is a really good signal. So I'm thinking about like uh, my kid in middle school who's not going to be super happy, you know, I'll just lay it out there, not super happy with an administrator walking down the hall or a teacher walking down the hall and pulling them aside. Like they're going to be really freaked out. Yeah. But if they see a signal, if they see that little blue ticket in their hand, then they mm. go, okay. I know what this interaction is going to be like. It's kind of yeah. clear. There's going to be, there, this is, this is going to be good. 
And that's really helpful for students for whom they've got a pattern of interaction with adults, which is any time an adult is catching them in the hallways, it's going to be something bad. You know, mm -hmm. they've got a one to 10 ratio instead of a five to one. This is a really good just signal like, hey, this is going to be a good conversation. I should listen up, you know, yeah. and that way when I, you know, when the vice principal says, hey, come on over here, um, you know, then my son is not going to say, you know, nope, thank you. I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. Not that and he would Jeff, do You're that. reminding me of when I was teaching and I did the same thing. I'd clip those along my, my keychain around my neck have those so I knew that but I think it what I think when I talk about acknowledgement systems to educators it's really like a tool to help us re remind us to have those positive interactions and mm -hmm. to stand out in the hallway to get out of your classroom to greet kids at you know my my daughter's principal when she was in Eugene stood and greeted all the kids and knew everybody by name the principal oh, yeah. that's is, so it, impressive it, it takes effort but it's part of creating an intentionally welcoming and inclusive environment mm -hmm. You also reminded me in your example of your middle school kids of how we often don't include students in this. Like sometimes we think mm -hmm. as the, I see a lot of Facebook groups I belong to and they're like, we need some ideas for acknowledgements. And I'm always like, ask the kids and they oh, yeah. don't always want, you know, I mean, an, an, an Apple watch or these big things that people think it needs to be. This big. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes they're like, I want, you know, a, a pass to go to recess two minutes early or things that don't cost anything. Like totally. I just say, including the kids, getting their voices heard, getting them to help generate some of these ideas. It really creates that, like, we're all in this together and it takes the pressure off the adults to think we have to come up with something like super cool or super big. Have you seen any, something what are some simple. of like the most... Find what are work. some of the most clever acknowledgements or rewards that you've seen, the systems that <laughs> you've seen put in place? You know, for me, one of the things that I have seen, and I'm not going to pick, I'm not going to say like, here's the one way no. to do it, because Daniel's no, no. absolutely right that it is about engaging students in it. Um, but I do think it's it's always amazing. Um, one of the, I think one of the problems with, rewards that people have is they have this sort of mindset of there's only one way to do it and I have to be really rigid about it and it really feels very uh kindergarten-y you know where yeah, it's like attention yeah, yeah, class yeah, right? let me wave this ticket in the air and let's all stand around and give Megan a round of applause for you know hanging up her coat <laughs> you know and and, maybe, and I'm like a 17 year old high schooler yeah <laughs> totally yeah so maybe kindergarten Megan liked that but maybe like high school Megan's not a big fan of it but yeah, it doesn't maybe matter gonna... it's a mismatch for me <laughs> yeah. yeah and so I think that um you know this idea that that praise can backfire is absolutely true you mm. know and sometimes it's sort of like okay wow megan's thinking like okay i just got this public praise i want to remember what i did to get that attention i'm never going to do that never again. ever going to do that, it again right? yeah mm -hmm. and so uh what we do is we do this thing called praise preference assessment we ask students to here are six ways that i am willing to acknowledge you in the classroom please in a survey circle the things that you think would be really cool and cross out the things that you would oh my gosh really not want. that please don't exactly class yeah and uh, I think one of the things that that uh, we've been surprised by and this is in doing the work um students were way less interested in the like classroom acknowledgement like the star in the jar or the marble yeah. or whatever it just overall what they really want what they were looking for was a like fist bump high five semi -pri semi public semi private yeah. kind of like you did a good job like not stopping the class and whatever but just a sort of like a a signal between the teacher and the student you did yeah. a good job like yeah. i see you i see what i see you and but doing it in less conspicuous or maybe a more cool way yeah totally yeah and everybody's different right yeah. so you know if we're at a you know we're in a gathering we're in a staff meeting I know that some people might really not want to get thanked you know for this thing that they did or or maybe if I do that uh I'm not being genuine enough because I haven't really thought through like something that's actually something really worth celebrating because, mm -hmm. you know, maybe maybe seven year old Megan is like she should be able to hang her coat up and like 
you know, it's, if, if we need yeah. help with it, that's fine. But like, let's not make it a stop the presses because she did something <laughs> yeah. sort of basic. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. That mm-hmm. makes sense. Uh, One of the other things that we've been trying to do in this series and over the course of the year is look for ways that we can talk about how equity plays into all of these Mm. systems, data, and practices of a PBIS framework. And so um, I guess the question really is, like, how does equity play itself out in an acknowledgement and reward system? Um, Mm. Yeah, how does it play itself out and how can we be make sure that we're being intentional about um, making it equitable for everyone. Yeah, this is something that is so critical and people just haven't paid enough attention to it. Uh, But some of my colleagues who I've learned from uh, back in the day, Terry Tobin, Claudia Vincent did a study where they were looking at um, inequities, particularly in terms of exclusionary discipline for black or African-American students and did PBIS make a difference implementation of and, and found that, yes, yeah, schools implementing PBIS had better equity in school discipline. But then they said, you know, is it all of the parts of it or is it some? And the one of the things that they found that was really, really critical, other than teaching expectations, was that schools that had better implementation of their formal acknowledgement systems had significantly better equity in school discipline. And so when I think about that, it's sort of, we spend all this time talking about the discipline gap. We should probably spend as much or maybe even more time talking about the acknowledgement gap. Like, Mm. are we uh, unintentionally or intentionally not giving this evidence-based practice of behavior-specific praise or positive-specific feedback uh, to students from marginalized groups? And um, if we're only providing this evidence-based practice to students from the uh, dominant culture in the school and so on, um, it's going to be really easy to see how this thing that is supposed to work really well is going to make things feel really inequitable. Do you think that gets back to defining the expectations in a way that matches or feels um, natural? to everyone mm-hmm. in your building that feels like you're represented in those expectations? Or do you think that it really is that we just have a blind spot as white or you know the predominant culture in the building to acknowledging students who are not a part of that group? Mm-hmm. I think it's both. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and the data show that the things that they were finding was one is that better teaching of the expectations. Another was that equity and acknowledgement. Then the other one was using data for decision-making, which are all mm-hmm. these really, really key things mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> that if we define what's expected of students as so different that it's really hard for students to bring their authentic selves into yeah. school, then it is going to be harder. Like we're we're putting a barrier in front of students to be uh, displaying that uh, behavior that we're all agreeing on uh, mm-hmm. that we want to see. And then it might be harder to do that. So I, I think it's a combination of both the way that we define it and also just in that moment that that's not what we're looking for. And I think that's a that can be a really painful kind of realization, but yeah. I'd rather have that painful realization and do something about it than be like, oh no, I couldn't do that. I'm fair to every student uh, instead of being like, no, it's actually like, let's really look at it. Let's count. Let's see if we uh, do something like uh, our tiered fidelity inventory walkthrough. Maybe we go through and we actually note um, if our data are showing that we are uh, exposing one group of students to exclusionary discipline more than others, then let's count where, um, when we're interviewing students, let's let's tally up. Is it is it equitable across those students when we say this question about like in the last two months, have you received a whatever panther paw or something like that? And mm-hmm. see if that looks fair. Uh, you know, we also have a survey is that feedback um, an input survey where you can ask all students, are they being acknowledged? Uh, are, have have adults been looking out? And you can actually look at those different by uh, race, by grade level, uh, by gender identity, uh, in secondary school, by sexual orientation, to, uh, to be able to see how 
uh, equitably dispersed our our acknowledgement systems are. Yeah, and I think it. I think the part about that, the FIS that you were talking about, that's so great, is that not only do you can you then you know ask adults in the building like how is or check on how how are these things going the impact is what you're assessing with that FIS is like mm-hmm. are students actually feeling like they've received that praise do they do what is their interaction with this system in our school and you, it, by looking at demographically how are wow. students experiencing acknowledgments and rewards you get a better sense of the equity included in it and the impact of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's that it, it it's less to do with, you know, have we done it proportionally by group <laughs> and much more about like the, the, um, those students experiences Yes, and the experiences that they have. And I, and, and, you know, it's, it is important to note that when you come from a group that is regularly marginalized, um, if you're expecting because of past experience that your school is kind of like stacked against you, then we as adults have to kind of name that, acknowledge that, talk with students about that and be really thoughtful uh, about how we do that. And so that might mean that we're doing more because we're countering that experience and the, the acknowledgement system might actually help buffer against the microaggression that might happen in the hallway right before then and so on that might lead to something that looks like defiance but is really a student feeling not connected with uh, their education or not seeing it as relevant to them yeah it gets right back to the that building relationships yeah go ahead danielle oh i'm just thinking about uh, acknowledgement systems in schools i've worked with and that some, you know, what we've been talking mostly is individual level acknowledgement. So Kent's mm. my student, I see him in the hallway walking and I acknowledge him for being safe. And I say that and all of that. But there's another layer that's often the school-wide acknowledgements. So mm-hmm. some schools put all those tickets in and they're wor- working their way up the thermometer. And when we get to this level, we're doing a school-wide celebration with, you know, a dance party or root mm-hmm. beer floats outside or what have you. And what I've seen, unfortunately, that I think is an equity issue as well is the students who get left out of those. So, mm-hmm. okay, let's say it's coming up Friday at 2.30, we're going to have this school-wide party, but these kids aren't getting to go because they've had a referral in the past so many days or because they mm-hmm. don't have all their assignments in Synergy and we're checking that or mm-hmm. those kinds of things. And I think that's an important question to ask might not come out in some of the surveys and those things, but it yeah. is really related to school climate and how are how are we all part of this community? And I would just advocate for, if we're saying, yeah, we're celebrating the success of, um, I'll say my daughter's school, the Alameda Eagles this Friday, mm-hmm. we're having a celebration, then that should be everybody. That's all the kids. That's all the staff. Like everyone should be part of that. But I don't know. I'd yeah. love to hear kids' thoughts on that too, because we see that often. I know as a teacher, even it would be like, oh, it's the party day, but maybe one of our, you know, I'm I'm man- managing the study hall for the kids that can't go or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Allow me to shout from the electronic rooftops that <laughs> referral free parties are not a PBIS practice. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Thank yes, you for yes, saying yes, it loud and clear. Not yeah. <laughs> be done. Yeah, if you're celebrating the community and and then you're saying, yeah, but you're not part of the community. Right. Like, why would we expect that that student not to be disconnected, drop out of school, and not show up? Like, we are literally telling them that they're not a valued member of this community. And that that just needs to end. Those yeah. uh, group systems, I love group rewards. I love interdependent rewards, but it is really, if we all contribute to it, then we all earn something. And maybe Danielle earned a little bit more because she got noticed a little bit more, but Megan benefits from it and Ned benefits from it. And we don't count in who got in uh, and who got out. So yeah, yeah, I I really want to like, that's, that's kind of like my number one thing that really uh, peeves me. Maybe that's a myth to deal (laughs) with that clip charts, Uh, Uh but that, that referral free party. Oh man. Yeah. What a bummer. Let's get rid of that. Let's stop what a bummer that. to walk by, like you were yes. saying, a thermometer and to watch it get bigger and bigger and you get excited about this thing. And then when the time comes, they're like, everybody can do it, but not you. Yeah, <laughs> you, you, walk by, you walk by the, the yeah. classroom, like yeah. oftentimes you walk by and it's like, 
oh, there's those kids and they're in yeah. the ISS room or the study hall room or some other place that's not a great place to be while the rest of the class go or school goes to celebrate. Like that's it just reminds me right now. Too. It does yeah. not. Yeah. Because of October, you know, it's the pumpkin patch visits or whatever. Yeah. And, and it seems like there's always, I always hear a story around this time. It's like, I'll hear from a, a colleague or a friend's like, my kid doesn't get to go. And I'm like, what? Yeah, because he, you know, yeah. didn't do this, that, or Whatever, the other thing. Yeah. And it blows me away. And sometimes this is with really young children. Yeah. It's like, that happened three weeks ago. What are you talking about? They now can't go to the pumpkin patch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, yeah. Yeah. The other thing that I, that's similar to that, that I've heard at least in, from my kiddos, one of my kiddos had this experience that where um, they were earning things uh, mm. as a class and then the teacher would remove, oh. um, like they, they were quiet enough. And so she got a marble in the jar, but then it got loud. And so she took the marble out mm -hmm. and I was like, but you earned that marble. <laughs> and she goes, well, we don't get to go early to recess today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, no, the, the reward is you because of something that was earned and uh, everyone should have access to that. And if you earned it, you earned it, you know? Absolutely. So if, uh, so I guess our last question that we like to ask our guests is, so now what, you know, like yeah. imagine you're, uh, you're talking to someone who comes to you and says, yeah, but this whole PBIS thing is just about rewards anyway. Right. Or you're a team at a school and you know that there's this feeling in the school that like PBIS doesn't work. It's just about the, it's just about the tickets, you know? Mm -hmm. So what are your recommendations for people that are listening? If this is something that comes up within their sphere often, what are your huh. recommendations for how to, how to address the myth or, um, or work with the people that are, that hold it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, this, I guess this falls into the uh, either or all or nothing approach. I think the very best thing is to just ask, these are the systems that we've got in place. What's working and what's not. Mm. There is no core practice of PBIS, no um, <clears throat> way that says that you can't, you, the only way you're doing rewards in PBIS is with tickets or things or school lotteries or anything like that. We do say you need to, you need to have a way to remember to notice it more mm -hmm. often than less. And so what that means is some people say, gosh, you know, I will do that. I will give positive feedback to students, but the ticket I'm uncomfortable with. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's I'm uncomfortable with the ticket because I don't like that it's traded in for food. And uh -huh, I don't right. want people to have a com uh, an uncomfortable relationship with food. And that's totally fine. Then say, great, get rid of food as a thing you can trade it in for, or get rid of the, um, get rid of any tangible things that come from getting your name drawn out in the assembly on Friday, just have somebody just get acknowledged a second time, you know, on Friday then. And, um, you know, one of the things that I was really thinking about, about it is like, okay, if I, if I know that those positive conversations are really important and I know that some people use a ticket system or something like that to help them, but I don't like that. You know, that's why we built this. We built this free app called Be Positive and you can uh, download, you can find out about it from a, a lovely article that mm -hmm. Megan penned mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. uh, free app you download and it just helps remind you to have a positive interaction with a student. You do all of that. It need not have a ticket. You need not have to have a Panther point. Uh, you don't need any kind of electronic systems that are, you know, projected on your smart board to do it. It's just that positive conversation. And so mm -hmm. doing that, I think, is really, really key. Um, and then the, the last thing I really do think is just if you're wondering, uh, gosh, I don't think that these reward systems are working for our students. My goodness, why not ask the students? Mm -hmm. Shocking, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and uh, sometimes the assumptions we make about our uh, the student experience is um, it, it we should we should get some data behind it and yeah. see the data. It can be surveys. It can be asking students. It can be just pull like having a conversation in your homeroom or your morning meeting uh, about it and just say, hey, what are the what are the things that you like about it? What are the things that you don't? How would it work a little bit better? Um, as opposed to being like, I don't like 
PBIS because of this thing that is like one way of doing it that isn't the only way of doing it. Yeah. It's interesting. You've come back to that whole idea of bringing in the community in this instance, students, mm -hmm. but starting with your community too. And it just, it's really kind of um, ringing true for me when we talk about um, bringing your whole community in on what are our values? What are our expectations? Which to me would lend itself to more equitable practices um, which also I think addresses some other myths. I feel like we're touching on all sorts yeah. of different myths. Um, oh, yeah. One of the which that I've heard in my experience is, well, this, this is just brainwashing of kids. If you're coming yeah. up with these, you know, and so we could go on and on about the different myths, but I really love that you came back to, we need to ask, we need to ask students, we need to bring our families involved. This is our community. This is the community we're building. So I just, I just really appreciate that perspective. And I, I think it addresses so many things um, that uh, that people experience or believe mm. about PBIS. I'm it's so also it's a through. simple thing to do. Like sometimes we think, oh, we need to go to this conference and learn about this. And those, I mean, obviously that's really helpful, but a lot of this is just asking your community, both the staff mm -hmm. and students, like, how's this working for you? What could be better? How does this feel coming to school every day? Mm -hmm. That alone and carving out space to, mm -hmm. you know, and giving folks of their voice is huge. It's really mm -hmm. huge. And I, too, I also think that getting back to um, defining for people the purpose, right? Like if you just, if you remove the ticket and the token and the erasers and the pencils and all of that, what we're really talking about is trying to build positive relationships with the kids in our, in our school and each mm -hmm. other. Right. And, uh, and one way to do that is to carry around some tickets in your pocket or around your keychain as little reminders that not only are you looking for the places where there there are challenges, but you're especially looking for the times when kids are doing all the great things that we know that they, they can do um, that make them and all of us successful. Mm -hmm. So the it's not about the token. It's right. not about the ticket. It's all about the relationships that you build. And the way to do that is to deliberately mm -hmm. have positive interactions with kids. So I think, so I, I think it's all so good. And I really appreciate you coming on and kind of clarifying some of this for us and for the people listening to the podcast appreciate you Kent and um Aww. yeah we're gonna we're gonna um see you again we get to talk to you one more time uh, later cool. later in the in our series we'll talk to you um about consequences so people can check that out um in the next couple of months thanks so much I appreciate you all this was a lot of fun <laughs>